do with children's sermons on a pretty regular basis. And I miss doing that. And so thanks, Fred, for letting me uh, for letting me practice on you. Um, you are a pretty easy customer. Usually when you have the kids, you never know what in the world they're going to say. You ask the question, and you don't know what answer you're going to get. So you got to be prepared for those curveballs. And if you ask... Um, They'll take it in a direction, and you never know who's going to be punching their brother or, you know, all, all the stories I can tell, but I won't. Well, um, I know Fred introduced me a little bit, but I don't know how much more you want to know about me. Um, my name is Cindy. My husband is pastor over at First Baptist Church in Davenport. And we just moved here about two years ago. We've been in Ohio for 25 years and finally got back over here because this is, you know, Iowa, Bettendorf is where Rob's from. We have two kids, uh, Benjamin and Abigail, Ben and Abby. Ben is, we left him back in Ohio. He's um, finishing up his uh, college at Miami University there. And my daughter Abby just graduated uh, high school and she is at, in Des Moines in college, so Rob and I are practicing this empty nest stuff, and it's a little bit uh, challenging. And I'm, I'm a substitute by trade. Uh, pastor, but I substitute in, in churches when pastors are on vacation. I substitute in the schools most month, uh, Monday through Friday um, as a substitute teacher there. I substitute in the bridge clubs, uh, Pastor Kathy, uh, got me to sub in the bridge clubs here too. So I just go around and kind of fill in holes everywhere. That's my calling in life right now. But lately, I don't know about you all, but my question is, um, maybe you have been this. Have any of you been encountering a lot of dumb people lately? <laughs> you know, crazy people, ignorant people, people who are just nuts. You have people that you look around and wonder what in the world were they thinking? You know, good Lord, this person just needs brain transplant. They're just really stupid. I, I work most of the time with middle schoolers during the week. So I can tell you that it's almost a daily occurrence with me that most middle school students have left their brains somewhere. Um, you're not sure if they have one, and if they do, you really should that they need a brain transplant. But even if you're not blessed with having middle schoolers and teenagers in your life, I'll bet you you run across plenty of dumb people in your life. All you have to do is turn on the TV, right? You watch the news and you see stories. You see what some politician says or does, and you go, oh, there goes another good candidate. A candidate for a brain transplant, right? Or you hear about the latest Hollywood gossip, and you just kind of shake your head at the stupidity of people. Or maybe you seem to be driving behind one of these stupid people every day on the way to work. Or maybe you sit across the desk from somebody like that at work. The bad news is, is that there are dumb people everywhere, aren't they? Dumb people everywhere. And sometimes it, you just shake your head and you wonder and you think, you know, the only possible option to help this situation is for these folks to get a brain transplant. But the even worse news is that modern medical science tells us that even if you go to the Mayo Clinic, we are still a long way off from that ever actually happening. But, you know, that's just modern medical science. They're scientists. What do they know, right? <laughs> Evidently, those scientists need a brain transplant. Because I'm here to tell you this morning that it really is possible already for that to happen. Seriously. You can get a new brain. You can change your brain and you can swap it out. Your brain is how you think. And the problem with all of these dumb people around is that either A, they aren't thinking, or B, they aren't thinking correctly, right? And they need to change that. They need to change their minds, how they think. Not just change their opinions, but they need to change the actual thinking process. They need to change their minds, their brains. And right now, we have the ability to choose what mind we will have. 
we have the ability to choose what mind you'll have. And we've been able to do that all along, even without any <coughs> medical science to do that. So I want you to turn with me to a scripture passage that will prove to you what I mean. And we'll explain it. So if you would like to turn um, to page 189 in your Pew Bibles, um, you can kind of follow along. I'm not sure what version your Pew Bibles are. Is that the NIV? No. And RSV? And I was like, well, guess what? I'm going to throw you a curveball, and I'm going to read something different because I like this translation better, but it's pretty close. And so you can kind of keep your eye on the scripture passage and follow along. I'm going to be reading from the English, English Standard Version today. But in the book of Philippians, I'm looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And in the book of, uh, in this book, Paul is writing to the church in the city of Philippi, and he is frustrated with their stupid behavior. He's been thinking the same thing that we think a lot of times, like, oh, good Lord, what are these people doing? They need a brain transplant. He, he's very frustrated with them. And he thinks that they need a new way of thinking because their thoughts are affecting their attitudes, and their attitudes are are affecting their behavior, which has just been stupid lately. And so here's what the Apostle Paul says to this church in Philippi. I'll be starting in chapter 2, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves. And in uh, chapter, verse 5, and I really, this is the reason I chose this translation. Some translations read, have the same attitude as Jesus, but I think the word here really implies more than just attitude. It implies mind, way of thinking, processing, wheels turning in your brain, that kind of thing. But in verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is God's word for us this morning. So keep your, keep your thumb on there. I'm going to keep referring back to it, so you, you might want to just kind of put that up on that one. But Paul is here describing the kind of mind, the kind of thinking, the kind of brain that we should choose to have. But the problem is, we don't always choose that kind of brain. I don't know how many of you are Mel Brooks fans. Have any of you heard of Mel Brooks? Okay. Any, do any of you like Mel Brooks? Okay, some of you do. I'm not a big Mel Brooks fan, um, but my dad is, so I had to watch those Mel Brooks movies growing up and watch Blazing Saddles and, wow. and watch um, <laughs> Young Frankenstein. If you're a Mel Brooks fan, I bet you know where I'm going with this. I don't know. But in Mel Brooks' movie, Young Frankenstein, Frankenstein, however you want to pronounce it, um, it's a comedy version. Uh, the Frankenstein story. It's a comedy. And there's a scene where Dr. Frankenstein, the scientist, is creating his monster, and he needs a brain for his creature. He needs a brain for his creature. So he sends his assistant, Igor, to the brain depository to get one. He sends him to the brain depository. And he doesn't want him to just grab any old brain. There's a whole bunch of brains in jars to grab. He says, I want you to look, he gives him instructions to get the brain of Hans Delbruck, scientist and saint. 
but it's a comedy. So Igor goes to the brain depository and he gets Hans Delbruck's brain in a jar and in the process of stealing the brain, he drops it, jar smashes, brain smashes, and so now he's got a problem, right? So he's thinking, okay, that's out. One brain is, a good, is as good as another. So he goes and grabs another brain in a jar off the shelf to take to Dr. Frankenstein. And they put that brain in the monster, and it doesn't go very well, right? And so Dr. Frankenstein says, wait a minute, what brain? Did you get the right brain? Did you get, and he says, no, I got a different brain. What brain did you grab? Well, I grabbed Abby somebody's brain. Abby somebody. Abby who? I grabbed Abby Normal's brain. He grabbed the brain that said abnormal on it. So, so they had an abnormal brain inside the monster, and that's what made that's what made it not work. So it does make a difference which brain you choose, right? One brain is not as good as another. But my daughter's name is Abby, and so we teased her about this all the time. Uh, most of us today, believe it or not, have an abnormal brain, and we're perfectly content with that. We don't think that it really makes a difference how we think, what mind we choose. But the Apostle Paul says, no, it makes all the difference. That there is one brain, one mind that you should choose. And he tells us what it should be. We need to choose the mind of Christ. And Paul goes on to explain just how unique and how different Christ's mind is from all the other abnormal ones out there. What's, one brain is not as good, just as good as the other. The mind of Christ is very different from the mind that we often choose to have. So if you're trying to look at all of the options of what kind of mind you want to choose, how do you tell the difference between the mind of Christ and all of the other options out there? The scripture tells us three, three ways that the mind of Christ is different. And the first way is the mind of Christ is selfless. The mind of Christ is selfless. It sets aside its own rights and thinks of someone else rather than of themselves. So if you look at verse 6, it says, Though Christ was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. Jesus was equal to God. Jesus is God. Jesus has the right to all the glory and honor and praise and power in the universe that God deserves. But Jesus set aside those rights because he loved us more than he loved his rights and privileges as God. And the Apostle Paul did the same thing. Paul always emphasized that the life of an apostle was the life of giving up his rights. As an apostle, he said that he had the right to receive financial support from the churches where he preached to them. But he set aside that right. He abandoned it because he wanted to share the gospel free of charge. Paul admonished the early church to give up their freedom, to give up their freedom to eat and drink whatever they wanted if it caused somebody else to stumble. Paul told these people that it's more important to act out of love for others than to make use of privileges that are rightfully yours. Having that kind of selfless mind is very different from the other selfish brains that we have in the world. Because I think we live in a society today that's dominated by rights activism. Because I think not a day goes by where we don't hear somebody shouting, I've got my rights, this is my right. But very often, claiming our rights is really just an excuse to sin. It's more of that selfishness, that me-first attitude. Think about that for a minute. That's my money. I worked for it. I have the right to do whatever I want with it. Usually that means we're not spending it very wisely. I can spend it on whatever I want instead of what you want me to spend it on. Instead of paying taxes, I can spend it on, you know, at the casino or whatever. I can do whatever I want with it. Or we say, it's my body. I have the right to do whatever I want with it. Even if it means I can stuff it full of junk food, I can have an abortion, I can flaunt it in skimpy clothing, it's my body, I can bathe and smoke, and I can do whatever I want with my body because it's mine. This week we're, you know, 
with the political season. I know you're in Illinois, but Iowa gets it all. You probably get all the political commercials, right? We're reminded a lot about our political freedoms, right? We've got, and I, seventh grade, we're dealing with the Constitution in school uh, the other day. And we have the freedom of speech and the right to bear arms and the freedom of assembly and freedom of the press. And there are some people with brains in this world that will tell you that that means you can say whatever freedom of speech means, you can say whatever you want. The right to bear arms means you can shoot whatever you want. And the freedom of assembly means you can hang out with whoever you want. And freedom of the press means you can publish whatever you want online for the world to see. But that mind is very different from the mind of Christ. Because the mind of Christ sets aside those rights for the benefit of other people. You may have those rights, but are you going to use them for selfish reasons? Or are you going to set them aside as selfless and be worried about demanding your own rights and protecting your own rights and interests? Or are you going to set them aside for the sake of the kingdom of God? Can you imagine how different the world would be if we lived with the mind of Christ instead of demanding our own rights? There are a lot of people with privileges in this world. Um, the President of the United States has a lot of privileges. Can you imagine what it would be if the past president, current presidents, future presidents, or any one of the people that are candidating as presidents, imagine if they forsook their rights. If they said, nah, I'm not going to live in the White House. I'm going to take in a small apartment in the inner city. Or instead of saying, sure, I love this fancy motorcade with flags and people in front of me and back, and instead, and I love having the Air Force One and all that, instead, what happens if they would just set aside their own rights and decide to use public transportation, or maybe even walk? Can you imagine that? Setting aside your rights? How about us? What would it look like if we set aside our privileges and our rights? We have enough food to eat. So much so that we drove half a minute away. We live in climate controlled offices and homes, and we have smartphones with internet access. We have privileges here that most of the world doesn't have. What does your brain tell you to do? Does your brain tell you to hold tight to your liberty, pursue your own happiness with gusto, do what you want to do with it? If that's what your brain and your mind is telling you to do, that's your abnormal brain talking. It's not the selfless mind of Christ. Because the mind of Christ says, set aside your privileges and your rights, and instead consider how to use those things for the good of other people. Which mind are you going to choose? The mind of Christ is selfless. But the mind of Christ is also characterized by serving. Having the mind of Christ is not just about giving up your rights and forgetting yourself. It's actually actively serving other people, doing something. Verse 7 says, Instead, Jesus gave up his divine privileges, and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Other translations say, he took the very nature of a servant. So a person could be very selfless and give up everything go live in the woods or in a cave somewhere and be a hermit. But the mind of Christ always takes it one step further. The scripture passage we read earlier in Mark, Jesus says, whoever wants to be great among you must first be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus served others. He washed the disciples' feet, he fed people, he cooked for them, he healed them, he hung out with the neediest folks in the world, and he helped them however they needed. The mind of Christ is actively searching for ways to help others, seeing what needs to be done, taking the initiative, and intentionally reaching out instead of just waiting around and doing nothing. So I think we need to ask ourselves, who are we actively serving? I told you I kind of hang out with teenagers. They need a brain transplant, obviously, but most teenagers are pretty oblivious to the things that need to be done around the house, right? Things that need to be done at school. They do just the minimum to get by. They'll, you know, if you say, 
Will you please take up that basket of laundry that has been sitting on the stairs for like three days? Oh, I didn't notice it was there. You know, they'll do it if you ask them to, but to actively be looking for what needs to be done, they just don't do it. That's not how their mind works, right? The same way at school. Um, they'll do the, they just want the bare minimum. You ask them to do something in school for your assignment, and they just get the groans. Oh, that's doing too much. I don't want to do that. And you know what? Adults need to look too. We need to look actively for ways that we can be serving and helping other people. Because normally, our abnormal brains just tend to deactivate, turn off, veg out when we're facing a hurting world. If we see needs on TV or see needs around, see needs around us, we turn off the news reports instead of, I don't want to hear about that, instead of actually engaging in the mess that we see. We tend to be like the Levite and the priest in the story of Good Samaritan, walk by on the other side of the road and pretend we don't really see it. When God calls us to be actively looking out for where people are in need. Sure, we might be self and selfless enough to do something if we directly ask about it, but intentionally looking for ways to serve, that takes a brain transplant. And a lot of times I think we are embarrassed to serve. We think we're above all of that. You know, we um, think we are better than changing bedpans or emptying garbage. We don't want low wage, low wage jobs. We think we're too good for that. But I think that's a misunderstanding of service. Serving other people is an honor. Serving other people is a privilege. We're not too good to serve other people. Actually, we aren't good enough to serve other people. We aren't good enough to serve other people unless we take the mind of Christ, unless God helps us. It's an honor to serve them and a privilege. We ought to be thankful that God helps us to be good enough to change bedpans and to take out the garbage and to be of service to other people. We need the mind of Christ in order to be lifted up to the position of a servant. So the mind of Christ is selfless. The mind of Christ is serving. But the mind of Christ is very different from all others because it has an attitude of submission and sacrifice. Verse 8, it says, and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We need to be submissive and obedient to God and to others. Now, being submissive and obedient in our society is about as popular as being a servant or giving up our rights. Most of us don't really like to be submissive and sacrificial. And you know what? I don't think Jesus really felt that great about it either. Obeying someone is fine as long as they ask you to do something you want or willing to do anyway. But when they tell you to do something that's inconvenient or disagreeable or difficult or painful, our feelings kind of change. Jesus did not want to go to the cross. He didn't feel that great about it. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and asked God if there wasn't some other way to please take this cup from him. Jesus didn't let his feelings be in charge, though. Instead, he chose to have a mindset of obedience and submission and say, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus obeyed the Father and went to the cross. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, how far does my obedience go? Am I willing to obey God even if it means I lose? Am I willing to obey God even if it means somebody else might not understand and be angry with me? Am I willing to obey God's word, even if I don't really like what it has to say? And we show what mind we have in these types of situations. Because the mind of Christ is submissive. It submits to God's will. Our abnormal brains tend to raise ourselves up above that. We raise ourselves up above God's word and say, oh, in my situation, the word of God, what the Bible is telling me to do, it doesn't apply here. I've got a better idea than that. Submission and obedience are not popular concepts. When was the last time you went to a wedding and actually heard the words love, cherish, and obey? Okay. 
can tell you it's not been at very many of the weddings that I've officiated at, right? I didn't use it at my wedding. But very few people like that word obey. A few people choose to read that passage in Ephesians where it talks about wives submitting to their husbands at, um, at their weddings either. Now, I, I consider myself a pretty liberated woman. I am. But I don't have a problem with the words obey and submit. I have difficulty living out those words. You can ask my husband how obedient I am. So, but I don't have a problem with the fact that I'm being asked to be submissive and obedient. Because I do think that scripture tells me to do that. Scriptures are asking me to be submissive and obedient. But I think what those scriptures really are asking is they're asking me to have the mind of Christ, to have the attitude of humility, and to value my husband above myself. <sighs> now, the scripture is asking the exact same thing of my husband too, though. Scripture asks the same things of husbands to lay down their lives for their wives, to value her above themselves, even to the point of death, just like Christ. So I guarantee you that when my husband and I have issues, when we have arguments, when we have conflicts, when we have problems in our relationship, which we do, I guarantee you it's because at least one of us, or probably both of us, are using our abnormal brains instead of having the mind of Christ. Because when we are both submissive and sacrificing and obedient to God, and when we are both submissive and sacrificing and obedient to each other, then we have the mind of Christ. And we don't have that. We're not using our abnormal brains. We are called to submit to a lot of people in our lives. We're called to submit to the governing authorities, to the government. We're called to submit to one another as husband and wife. We're called to submit to church leaders. We're called to submit to God. And we like submission when it's in one direction. When we get other people to submit to me, and it's totally awesome, right? It's great when people submit to me and obey me. I love it. I wish kids would do that in school. But it's difficult when we're asked things to go the other direction. When we are asked to submit to somebody else. Then it's hard. And we have a problem. Because we think of submission as a sign of weakness. Well, if I have to submit to somebody else, then I must be weak and less than. But submission is really a sign of power. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, this is what Jesus says. He says, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Do you hear that? That's power. Jesus says sacrifice and submission shows power. It shows power and strength. He has the power to lay it down. Sacrifice takes strength. Obedience is not easy. Obedience is hard. Submission requires power beyond ourselves. It's the immature, abnormal brain that rebels and throws a tantrum when we're told to do something we don't like to do or when we're told we don't have to do something we don't want to do. But the mind of Christ says, not my will, but yours be done. The mind of Christ is very different from all those other brains out there that we can choose. It's a different way of thinking. It requires us to change our thoughts, and that's going to change our attitudes, and then that's going to change our actions and the way we behave. And the good news is that we can do it. We can get that brain transplant now. And it doesn't matter how many people are looking at us and shaking their head and going, where is your brain? There's still hope for us. We're not stuck with an abnormal brain. We don't have to wait for modern science. We don't have to have surgery. We just have to look at scripture. Verse 5 says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ is ours when we are in Christ Jesus, when we believe in him. When we receive Christ through faith, when we have the Holy Spirit, we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 says, And we have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so that we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. We understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. 
So the good news is you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to the brain depository. You don't have to worry about dropping the jar. It can be done right here. It can be done in our seats. And so if you haven't already done it before, I want to make you this offer. Receive Christ. Allow Christ to give you a new life. Allow Christ to give you a new heart. Allow Christ to give you a new mind. Because you can trust in his mind. Because it's the same selfless, sacrificing mind of Christ that led him to die for you. You don't want Pastor John to give you brain surgery. You don't want me or some self-help guru to give you a new brain and give you a new mind. But I'm here to tell you that you do want Jesus Christ to do that. Won't you let him give you his mind? Will you pray with me? Lord God, you know that our way of thinking is so often very far from what you call us to. You know that we are selfish and self-centered, that we love being in positions of power, and we are often not very concerned about those around us. But Lord, we want to turn our thoughts over to you. We ask that you would give us that new mind. We ask that you would give us your mind so that as we look around, we might be actively looking for ways to help others. We might see them through your eyes. We might be focused on what you are calling us to do. And we might be willingly obedient to what you ask of us. Lord, we know that it goes against our natural way of thinking. And that our only hope is to have the mind of Christ. And so we're going to place ourselves into your hands. We're going to ask you to perform that brain surgery. To give us your thoughts. So that we might reflect your love to the world around us. And that other people might come to know you. And might receive your mind. And that you would be glorified. As each and every person in this world. Starts to bow at their knees and confess that you are Lord. Lord, you are the ruler of the universe. Your mind is great. You have created this universe. Help us to reflect that mind. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Closing hymn.